Good morning and a warm welcome to your service today. It's good to see you here. Uh, just let me run through the announcements before we begin properly. Uh, we meet again this evening at 6.30 uh, for prayer in the Nelson Room before the service of worship at 7 o'clock. So uh, do come again uh, this evening, uh, thinking about uh, parents and children today from uh, Colossians. Uh, the Congregational Committee will meet uh, tomorrow night at 7.45 and the Finance Subcommittee will uh, meet beforehand. So uh, please bear that in mind if you're on the subcommittee uh, but also on the committee. The Bright Hour is on Tuesday afternoon and the speaker this week is a missionary from EMF uh, and all ladies of the congregation are uh, welcome to come along to that. Uh, midweek Bible study and prayer meeting for all the congregation Wednesday at 7 45 uh, so as we pray for the extension of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. Uh, then we're hoping to have this year's carol service on Sunday evening, the 17th of December. And again, we're hoping to have a choir take part at that carol service. Uh, so choir practice will begin on Thursday, the 23rd of November for four weeks. Uh, and anyone who would like to be part of that choir should come along on the 23rd or speak to Karen if you'd like more information on what's involved. But uh, it's worked well the last couple of years, is it? Uh, and so it's good to get uh, as many people as possible to take part in that choir. Uh, I'm hoping to have a meeting of the CARE team on Monday evening, the 20th November. So the CARE team, uh, members of the CARE team, they, they visit folk in the church, maybe elderly people or sick people, uh, maybe do it, they do it regularly. So we haven't met as a team for a long time. So hoping to have that meeting on Monday evening. Uh, if you're on the CARE team and you can't come, uh, maybe just let me know. If you can come, let me know as well so I know how many to expect. And if anybody's interested in becoming a member of the care team, then you could speak to me uh, about that. BB Week begins today, and the BB thanks the congregation for the continued support financially and also prayerfully for the, the boys in the company. Uh, they're once again using envelopes for any donations, and so they, those are placed at the back of the church uh, and also uh, out that door in the link corridor. Uh, if you'd like to contribute, then uh, please leave your envelope in the offering plate or give it to one of the BB officers. And you can also write your FWO number on the envelope if you wish. Uh, I think that's uh, for gift aid. Uh, 
All that money raised during this time is used directly for the boys and for the advancement of Christ's kingdom among, among the boys. So uh, many thanks for that. That's from the 120th BB. So if you can help with that, please pick up an envelope and use it. Anyone who requires a 10-month statement of their FWO contribution should please contact Kevin Harvey or Liam White and let them know if you'd prefer a printed copy or uh, just a copy emailed to you. Don't forget the memory verses for November, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. There are cards available uh, to take away just to, uh, to remind you of that, those verses. Don't forget the Vine Center Christmas Appeal. Uh, so they're distributing food hampers and Christmas presents to families in the area. Uh, they can take food donations, but they can take financial donations and also looking for uh, new toys and, and presents uh, suitable for children and uh, adults as well, uh, again, in the link order in the display cabinet, you can see a list of uh, items that uh, they uh, can accept. So you might like to take a look at that. And all gifts should be delivered to the Vine Centre by Monday, the 11th of December. Or you can give them to Nan Simpson or Tim Fitzsimons as well. And then finally, oh, no, not finally. Please add your name to the new schedule on the notice board. Uh, if you'd like to take uh, part in the Sunday services by leading in prayer or doing the Bible reading, again, that's out th through that door. And just the final one to remind you again about the EMF uh, conference. So this Saturday uh, in Stramillis uh, Evangelical Presbyter <laughs> Presbyterian Church, or if you want to, there's the SGA, uh, their events on Friday and Saturday uh, of this week as well. So pick up the leaflets about those uh, if you want to go along. Those, I think, are all the announcements, and uh, we're here to worship God. And in Psalm 118, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. So let's give thanks to God for his steadfast love. Let's stand to sing part of Psalm 118. Oh, thank the Lord, for he is good. Let's join together in prayer. And we give thanks to you, O Lord our God, because you are a good God and your love endures forever. And how you have loved us, uh, you're the one who has given us our life and you sustain us day by day, giving us health and strength and daily food. You're the one who's given us a Savior, your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, by whose sacrifice you've established a lasting peace between us. 
You've given us your Holy Spirit to enable us to trust in your Son and to receive from him all that he won for us on the cross. You've given us the church and the fellowship of your people and the proclamation of the gospel through word and sacrament. You've given us the assurance of sins forgiven and the hope of the resurrection of our bodies uh, from the grave and the promise of eternal life in your presence. And so we give thanks to you because you have been good to us and your love towards us and all your people endures forever. Heavenly Father, you have been good to us, but we confess that we're sinners and that we have done what is wrong. We confess that from our childhood until this very day, we have broken your law and we've disobeyed your commandments by our sinful thoughts and words and desires and deeds. And we confess that we haven't loved you as we should with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. Instead of seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, we have so often been self-seeking and selfish. Uh, we have uh, disregarded your word. We've doubted your loving kindness. We've been worried and anxious about many things instead of trusting in you, our heavenly father. So heavenly father, we confess our sins and our shortcomings and we ask that you'll forgive us our sins and that you'll cleanse us from all that is not right. Remove our sins from us as far as the east is from the west and remember them no more. And we ask this not because we deserve it, but because Christ our Savior laid down his life to free us from condemnation and he was raised to give us eternal life. So will you please forgive us and will you give to all who trust in your son the assurance of sins forgiven and the hope of everlasting life. And then help us to walk in your ways more and more and to do your will here on earth. For we ask it in our Savior's name. Amen. And having confessed our sins, let's hear the good news from Romans 8 where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God for his kindness to us um, in Christ. Let me invite the boys and girls to come up to the front now. I'm going to speak to them at, the, at this point in the service. Okay, good to see you. Good to see you. Yes. Excellent, right, yeah. There's plenty of room over here. Good, and I suppose anybody want to say anything? You, anything exciting happened to you this past week? Anything interesting you want to tell me about? Do you want to say something? I moved up a wee bit in school. You say that again? I moved up a wee bit in school. You moved up? A reading group. A reading group in school, fantastic. Oh, well, well done, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so uh, does that mean that you're reading harder books, bigger books? Harder books, okay, fantastic. Okay, what's what's the what's the hardest word you know how to spell? You're not sure. There's so many. There's so many, aren't there? So many. Do you like reading? No. <laughs> reading reading's great. What about anybody else? Anybody else want? To, well, well done for moving up the, the, to the, the next group. Anybody else want to say something? No. Okay, well, listen, I'll tell you, the, I'll tell you a story today. I, I think, you, not here, because last week we were doing something different, weren't we? We were doing the baptism. But I think in children's church last week, you were, started to hear about Moses. Is that right? Uh, and Moses, he met God. Where did he meet God? Do you remember where he met God? In the, in the burning bush. Do you remember God appeared in the burning bush? Uh, so he was out in the wilderness looking after the sheep. And, uh, and then he saw the burning bush. We've got a burning bush up there on the wall. You see that? Well, Moses saw this burning bush, a real burning bush. And when he went, it was God. Uh, and God spoke to him from out of the, the burning bush. And uh, God told him how he, uh, Moses, was to lead God's people out of Egypt where they were slaves. And God was going to bring them into the promised land. So I think that's what you were doing last week in children's church. So here's a picture of, uh, well, Moses before the burning bush, he's falling down on his face because he's in front of God. Uh, God isn't the burning bush. God is in the burning bush or he's speaking from it. And Moses falls down to worship God and to listen to him. And uh, so afterwards, 
because Moses, God was telling Moses, you have to lead my people out of the land of Egypt. So Moses got up and uh, he headed home because he'd been away from Egypt for a long, long time. Many years, he hadn't been back to Egypt, but now it was time to go back and do what God uh, wanted him to do. So he went there, he had his wife and his two children with him, and uh, he was on his way. And I don't know, did you hear last week about how Moses was reluctant? He said, you know, I'm not able to speak well. And uh, God said, well, uh, what about your brother Aaron? He can speak for you. Did you do that last week? Well, because in the next picture I've got, there's Aaron. God had said to Aaron, go and, and meet Moses. And uh, so he went out and he met Moses as Moses was coming back to Egypt. And uh, Moses was able to tell his brother Aaron everything that God had said to him at the burning bush. And he also told him about the signs God gave. So Moses had said, what happens if the people don't believe uh, what I'm saying? And so God said, well, if they don't believe you, do these signs. And do you remember what the signs were? One was he had a stick uh, and he was to, or a staff, and he was to throw his stick down in the ground and it turned into something. Do you remember what it turned into? It turned into a snake. It turned into a snake. And then God said, well, pick up a snake. And when he picked up the snake, it turned back into the stick. And then another one was he was told to put his hand into his coat. And when he took his hand out again, his ha hand was white, uh, uh, pale white, sickly white. And then when he put it back in again, it was normal again. Those were the signs. So Moses told his brother about those signs. And the two of them set off to go back to Egypt. And when they got there, they met with all the leaders of the Israelites, the leaders of God's people. And they told them everything that God had said and what God was going to do for them and how God had heard their groaning because it was hard work being a slave. And God was going to bring them out of Egypt and he was going to bring them into the promised land where they were going to live there uh, f uh, 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 forever. And, uh, and they showed them the signs as well. And the people, when they heard, they thought, fantastic. You know, we're tired being slaves. You know, we don't like the, the Egyptians bossing us around. This is great. God has heard it, about us, and he wants to help us, and he wants to bring us into the promised land. They thought, fantastic, fantastic. So the next thing is they had to go to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh, he was the king of Egypt. So he's a man in the funny hat there. He was the king. He was in charge of everything. And uh, they, went before, uh, Pharaoh, uh, they went before the Pharaoh and they said, uh, Moses and Aaron, the Lord says, let my people go. And whenever Pharaoh uh, heard them say, the Lord says, let my people go, Pharaoh said, well, I don't know who the Lord is. I don't know who you're talking about. You know, why should I uh, listen to you? Uh, I don't know who you're talking about. And uh, so Moses and Aaron went on to say to him, well, you know, he's our God. And uh, he says where to go and uh, worship him in the desert. And uh, we have to do that or else he'll send plagues uh, upon us. And uh, when Pharaoh heard that, he started getting angry. He started getting angry. And uh, he said, I don't know who the Lord is and you're just lazy. You're not doing any work now. You should be outside working for me, but you're not. You're here talking to me. You're just lazy. And he got so angry with them and uh, told them to get out. And he didn't just tell them to get out, but he also said to the slave drivers, he says, I, they're just getting lazy, so you have to work them hard. Make them work even harder than before. And what their job, what they had to do in those days is they had to make bricks, and then with the bricks, they were able to make buildings. And so the Israelites, God's people, they had to make all the bricks. And one of the ways they made the bricks was to put straw in the mixture, because that made the bricks stronger. And uh, Pharaoh said, listen, we used to give them straw to make bricks. Don't give them straw anymore. They have to find their own straw, but they have to make the same amount of bricks as before. So we're not going to give them the straw they need. They have to find that, and then they have to make the same number of bricks as before. Uh, so that was going to be really hard for them. And the slave drivers went out and they began to beat the people because they weren't working hard enough and they weren't making the same number of bricks. And it was just hard work for them having to go and look for the straw and then bring it back and then make the bricks. It was just hard work. 
and they were discouraged, they were fed up, they were miserable, and the slave drivers were beating them, saying, you're getting lazy, you're getting lazy, work harder, work harder, work harder. When they complained to, to Pharaoh, Pharaoh just, in a sense, put his fingers in his ears. He didn't care. He just says, you're being lazy, work harder. Well, the leaders of the, the people, the Israelites, they got together and they said, you know what? Things have been a disaster since Moses and Aaron came along. They complained to Moses and Aaron saying, you know what you've done? You've just made our life even more miserable. You know, God should judge you because you've made our life worse, not better. And uh, the leaders then were angry with Moses and Aaron. So what did Moses do? Well, he did what we're meant to do. He turned to God in prayer and he prayed to God and he said, look, God, this is what's happening. Is this why you sent me here? The people's lives are miserable now. Uh, what are we to do? He prayed to God for help because of all the bad things that had happened to God's people. And God spoke to Moses and God said, well, listen, I'm the Lord, your God, and I've heard the groaning of my people and I'm going to bring them into the promised land as I said I would, and I'm going to judge the Egyptians, I'm going to punish them for what they've done to you, and I'm going to save my people. I promise. That's what I'm going to do. And Moses went out, having heard what God had said, he went out and told the people what God had said. But the people didn't believe. They were so fed up, they were so disappointed, they were so discouraged, they didn't believe because things were just miserable for them. And so the people should have believed, they should have trusted that God was going to use Moses to bring them out of their slavery and to bring them into the promised land where they'd be free. And uh, boys and girls, we have to trust God too. We have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to trust in God because He sent the Lord Jesus just as God sent Moses, so God has sent the Lord Jesus to save us from our sin and to give us eternal life in His presence. And maybe sometimes it's hard, and maybe we sometimes wonder, what's God doing? And maybe sometimes people are mean to us, but still we're to trust God that Jesus Christ will save us from our sins and bring us into eternal life with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you sent Moses to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt, to bring them to the promised land where they would be free. And we thank you that you've done something even better for us. You sent your Son into the world to free us from our sin and to give us eternal life in your presence in heaven. So will you help us all to trust in your Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in you always, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, maybe people laugh at us, Maybe things are going wrong, but help us still to trust in you and in Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks. You want to go back to your seats, and we're going to sing our song before we go into Children's Church. God is so good.
colors in the rainbow Who put the salt into the sea? Who put the coal in the snowflake? Who made you and me? Who put the hump upon the camel? Who put the nest on the... Well, every year we have this uh, break brief act of remembrance to uh, remember and to give thanks to God for those who gave up their lives in the two world wars and in subsequent wars and conflicts so that we can enjoy peace. And as each year goes by and as the world wars uh, seem further and further away, it becomes even more important for us to take the time uh, to remember lest we forget the sacrifice of so many. So uh, as we do each year, we're going to pray and in the prayer we'll give thanks to God for the peace we enjoy and we'll pray for peace in the world. Uh, we'll remember with thankfulness to God those who uh, have fallen in conflict. And then after the prayer, I'll read some words from Lawrence Binion's poem for the fallen. Uh, then uh, a bugler will play the last post and we'll observe the two minute silence. And then the bugler will play again. And uh, the last post and the silence and then the second bugle uh, call, uh, they bear witness to the hope of the resurrection. Uh, the last post signifies death and how so many have died in wars. Uh, the two minutes silence signifies how the dead lie silently in their graves. And then the second bugle call known as Roy's uh, signifies the resurrection of the dead which will happen when Christ comes again. And all those who trusted in Christ in this life will rise from their graves to enjoy everlasting life in the new heavens and earth. And uh, no doubt many of those who died in the world wars and subsequent wars believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, no doubt they went to war and faced its terrors, believing in the resurrection and everlasting life with the Lord. And uh, that's our hope as well. And it helps us to face all the troubles and trials of this life. It helps us as well to face death. And so in the silence, as we remember the dead and give thanks to God for them, and as we give thanks to God for the peace we enjoy in this life because of the sacrifice of so many, we can also give thanks to God for the hope of the resurrection and the good news that because of Christ, death is not the end. So, uh, will the congregation, if you're able to, please stand uh, for the prayer and the silence. Please stand. And Almighty God, on this Remembrance Sunday, we give thanks to you for the peace we enjoy every day and for being allowed to live quiet and peaceful lives. And we remember all those nations where there is no peace and where people are suffering each day because of war and violence and where people are afraid for their safety. Will you have mercy upon them? And we pray that you'll grant them peace so that they too will be able to live in safety and without fear. We pray that the leaders of the nations throughout the world will be peacemakers working to establish peace in their own nations and doing whatever they can to ensure there is peace between the nations. We pray that you'll enable them to use their authority and their influence for good in the world. We pray for our own leaders and for the members of our security forces asking that you'll help them in their work and enable them to uphold law and order in this country. And Heavenly Father, on this Remembrance Sunday, we want to pray for all those who are grieving today because someone they love was killed in a war overseas or in the conflict in our own country. We pray that you'll have mercy upon them and help them. We pray too that they will be comforted with the hope that comes from knowing you as their Father and Jesus Christ as their Savior. We think of those from our own congregation who have lost loved ones because of war or violence and we ask that you'll give them the strength they need as they continue to grieve and mourn for their loved ones. And we ask that you'll lift them from their darkness and distress into the light and peace which comes from knowing you and your son Jesus Christ. We remember with gratitude all those who have given up their lives for us those members of the armed forces and the security forces who die that we might enjoy life, those who gave up their own safety so that we could live in safety today, 
we remember them and we ask that you'll help us to use this act of remembrance to give thanks to you for them and help us to give thanks to you for the hope of the resurrection and everlasting life in your presence. And we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. be seated.
Well, now that you've caught your breath and had a seat, uh, we're going to stand and uh, we're going to sing, Here is love vast as the ocean. God's Word, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. So 2 Kings chapter 2, this is God's Word. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets of Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elisha said to him, Stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets of Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I do know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided into the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, uh, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this, sorry, Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, 
the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have 50 able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down in some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So he said, send them. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days and did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? The men of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained wholesome to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us today. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today's story uh, or t- tells, uh, start again. Today's passage uh, tells us the true story of how Elijah the prophet was taken up to heaven. Uh, the first time we heard of Elijah was back in chapter 17 of chapter 1, or, or 1 King, sorry, uh, when Elijah burst onto the scene without I- introduction to announce in the name of the Lord that there would be no rain in the next few years except at his word. And after making that announcement, the Lord told him to hide uh, at the Kerith Ravine, and the Lord took care of him there, because the Lord sent birds to provide him with uh, bread and meat for food. Then the Lord commanded him to go to Zarephath and Sidon and stay stay there with a widow, and the Lord took care of him there, uh, because the Lord ensured that the widow's jar of flour did not run out, and her jug of oil uh, didn't run dry, so that she was always able to make bread for herself and for her son and for Elijah. And when the widow's son died, Elijah was able to bring him back to life. And so it became clear to the widow that Elijah was indeed the Lord's prophet. That was in chapter 17. In chapter 18, we had the story of the contest in Mount Carmel between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. The prophets of Baal were to call on Baal to send fire on the altar. Uh, Elijah was to call on the Lord to send fire on his altar. And whoever sent fire was the true God. And of course, nothing happened uh, when the prophets of Baal prayed to Baal because Baal is nothing and can do nothing. But when Elijah prayed to the Lord, the Lord sent fire, which burnt up the offering on his altar and it burnt up the, o- the altar itself and it uh, burnt up the ground around it, all of which had been soaked with water. And so it became clear that the Lord is a true God and Baal is nothing. That was in chapter 18. In chapter 19, Elijah traveled from Jezreel in the north all the way to Mount Sinai in the south, where the Lord had established his covenant with the Israelites in the days of Moses. And Elijah went there as a kind of prosecuting attorney to charge the people of Israel with rejecting the Lord's covenant because instead of worshiping the Lord, they were now worshiping Baal. And the Lord responded to his accusation by making clear that while he would punish some of them for their rebellion, he would would not abandon them completely, and he would keep 7,000 Israelites for himself. So he would punish some, but not all. He would punish some of them, but he would save some of them from their sin and rebellion. And after that, Elijah met Elisha for the first time and threw his cloak over him 
to signify that from that time on, Elisha would be one of the Lord's prophets too. That was chapter 19. Uh, Elijah isn't mentioned at all in chapter 20, uh, but then he appears again in chapter 21 in the story of Naboth's vineyard, when the Lord sent Elijah to confront King Ahab about his sin. He's not mentioned in chapter 22, but he appeared again in chapter 1 of 2 Kings, which we studied last week, where he warned King Ahaziah that he would surely die. And so now we come to chapter 2 of 2 Kings, which tells us about the end of Elijah's life here on earth. And the fact that he didn't die, but was taken up alive to heaven, tells us that there is another life beyond this life. So there's this life, and there's the life to come. And though the Lord took his prophet away, he wasn't going to leave his people on their own because this chapter also tells us about Elisha who performed the same miracle as Elijah performed when he struck the Jordan River uh, with Elijah's cloak. The water parted so that he could uh, go across on dry land. And so it became clear that God had chosen Elisha to replace Elijah. And the Lord would now speak to his people uh, through him. The chapter can be divided up geographically uh, because in the first half, Elijah travels to Bethel and then to Jericho and then to the Jordan River. And then in the second half, Elisha travels to the same places, but in reverse. So he travels from the Jordan to Jericho and then to Bethel. So if you've got your Bibles open, let's turn to verses 1 to 6, which tell us about Elijah's journey to the Jordan and uh, some of us uh, don't like spoilers, uh, so if someone's telling us about a book or a movie, we say, no spoilers, please. You don't, don't spoil the plot for me. Don't tell me what's going to happen. I want it just to happen, to unfold in front of me. Uh, well, our narrator isn't too worried about spoilers because he tells us in verse 1 what's coming up uh, in the rest of the chapter. He tells us that the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And that means we, we all know what's going to happen in this chapter before any of it happens. The story begins in Gilgal and Elijah turns to Elisha and tells him to stay there because the Lord has sent him to Bethel. We don't know why Elijah didn't want Elisha to accompany him. We don't know why Elisha refused to do what Elijah said. All we know is that Elisha insisted that he will not leave Elijah. He wants to go with him. And at this point in the story, we don't know whether Elijah and Elisha know what's going to happen to Elijah. We know, but do they know? When they reach Bethel, a company of prophets come out uh, to meet them. And uh, that reminds us that Elijah and Elisha aren't the only prophets at that time. And from time to time, we read about other prophets. Well, here, there's a whole company of them, a whole group of them. And it turns out that they know what's about to happen to Elijah. Uh, so presumably, the Lord revealed it to them. They asked Elisha if uh, he knew what's going to happen, and it turns out that he does know. Uh, the Lord must have revealed it to him as well, but it's clear from verse 3 that he doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, although Elijah wasn't going to die, uh, it would still be like a bereavement uh, for Elisha because he would never see Elijah again in this life. And so perhaps he didn't want to speak about it uh, because it was going to be like a bereavement for him, and it was just too painful to talk about in verse 4, Elijah spoke to Elisha again and told him to stay uh, there in Bethel uh, because he now had to go to Jericho. Once again, Eli Elisha insists that he'll not leave Elijah. He's going to go too. When they reach Jericho, there's another company of prophets. Uh, they come out and say the same thing to Elisha. Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? And once again, Elisha replied that he does know, but I don't want to talk about it. In verse 6, Elijah tells Elisha to stay in Jericho because he now he has to go to Jordan, uh, to the Jordan. Uh, and so you'd think that Elijah would have got the message by now. You'd think that he'd now realize that Elisha isn't going to leave him alone. But still, uh, he tells Elisha to stay. And Elisha once again says to him, I'm not going to leave you. And so the two of them walked on towards the river Jordan. And in verse 7, we're told that the two of them are not on their own because 50 of the prophets are with them, but they're standing at a distance. But they were there and they could see what happened when Elijah and Elisha reached the Jordan River. According to verse 8, Elijah took off his cloak, he rolled it up and he used it to strike the water. 
And the water divided to the right and to the left, creating a dry path for them uh, through the middle. And Elijah and Elisha crossed over on dry land to the other side. Recalls what happened in the days of Joshua, doesn't it? At that time, the Israelites came to the Jordan River. The Lord opened up a path for them uh, through the waters so that they were able to cross over on dry land into the promised land of Canaan. And now the Lord performed the same miracle by the hand of Elijah. And when they crossed over, Elijah asked Elisha what he can do for him before he's taken away. So is there one last thing I can do for you before I go? And Elisha's reply is in the second half of verse 9, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And now when I used to read that, I assumed that Elisha was saying he wanted to possess twice the amount of the Holy Spirit as Elijah possessed. So he was saying, Elijah, you were filled with the Holy Spirit, but I want to be filled with even more of the Spirit. I want to be greater than you. But he's not asking for that. Uh, in biblical times, the eldest son would inherit a double portion of the inheritance. So if there were two brothers, uh, the elder would receive two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son would receive a third. The elder received twice what his brother got. And so Elisha refers, uh, when Elisha refers to a double portion, he's really saying that he wants to be Elijah's heir. And he wants to take Elijah's place as a prophet. So he wants to receive all the gifts of the Spirit which he needs in order to serve as the Lord's prophet, just as Elijah had done. And Elijah replied that uh, he had asked for a difficult thing. Uh, it's difficult for Elijah because it's not up to him to decide who should succeed him uh, as prophet. That's for the Lord to decide. Uh, who sends his spirit on whomever he wants. But he gives Elisha a sign. Uh, if Elisha is allowed to see Elijah when he's taken away, or as he's taken away, then Elisha will know that God has indeed chosen him to replace Elijah. And as they walked along, suddenly a chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared and separated them one from the other. The chariot has to separate them because one is going to be taken and the other is going to be left behind. And though I remember a children's Bible uh, uh, with a picture of Elijah riding up to heaven on a fiery chariot, verse 11 makes clear that Elijah went up in a whirlwind. So the chariot separated the two men and then a whirlwind picked Elijah up and carried him upwards to heaven. And what a sight it must have been. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, my father, my father. Elijah wasn't his father, but uh, he regarded him and loved him as a father. And then he called him the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Uh, no doubt the sight of the fiery horses and, and chariot put this image in mind. Uh, but by describing Elijah as Israel's chariots and horses, he's saying that Elijah was Israel's defense. Just as a king might use chariots and horses to defend the people from their enemies, so Elijah was Israel's defense against unbelief and sin because he was the one who declared the word of the Lord. And the narrator tells us that Elisha saw Elijah no more. And to show his grief and sorrow, he took his hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. And so the Lord's great prophet has gone the one who, like a chariot and horses, defended Israel from unbelief and sin by declaring the word of the Lord, he's gone. God's great prophet has gone. And yet the good news is that the Lord has, was not going to leave Israel without someone else to defend them. Because now Elisha would be Israel's defense. And so we read that, Eli, uh, that uh, he picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen from him, and he retraced their steps and came to the river Jordan. And just as Elijah had done, he struck the water with the cloak and asked, where is the God, the, 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 the God of Elijah? And the Lord was there with Elisha, because when he struck the water, the water divided uh, to the right and to the left so that he was able to cross over and dry land again. And the other prophets were there to see it. And so it was clear to them that the spirit of Elijah was now resting on Elisha. 
According to verse 16, they offered to go and look for Elijah because it seemed to them that the Lord may only have picked him up and uh, put him somewhere else. And though Elisha told them not to bother, they insisted. But of course, they couldn't find Elijah because Elijah was now in heaven with the Lord. And taking Elijah up to heaven when he was still alive makes clear to us that there's more than the world around us. And there's more than what we can see. There's this world which we can see. There's a sky above and there's this space beyond it with all the stars and planets and the sun. We can see all of those things either with our naked eye or with telescopes. But then there's also the invisible heaven where God dwells with his angels. And not only are the angels there, but there's also Enoch, whom we read about in Genesis 5, who did not die. Because God took him away when he was still alive. And there's also Elijah who did not die because God took him away when he was still alive. God took them away so that they were transported straight into heaven and into the presence of the Lord. And by taking Enoch and Elijah away when they were still alive, God was making clear that there's more than this world which we can see. Since they didn't die, uh, their remains aren't buried uh, somewhere. You can't go and dig them up. You can't go and dig them up because they're not there. And they're not there because God took them into the invisible heaven where he dwells with his angels. And so what happened to Elijah speaks to us of the hope of eternal life in the presence of God. And the hope of eternal life in the presence of God is not only for one or two special people like Enoch and Elijah, it's for everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus promised that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. And so after our life in this world is over, all who believed in Christ will live with God in the invisible heaven, where God dwells with his angels and with Enoch and with Elijah. And there in the invisible heaven, God's believing people await the resurrection of their bodies so that they will live in body and soul with the Lord in the new heavens and earth. And we're able to have eternal life in the presence of God because of Christ our Savior who gave up his life to pay for our sins. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. That's what we all deserve for all that we have done wrong. But the Lord Jesus paid for what we have done wrong when he died on the cross in our place. And since he has paid for our sins with his life, then all who believe in him will be set free from death to live with God forever. We still die. But for those who believe, death is no longer the penalty for our sins, but it's the doorway into God's presence. God carried Elijah into heaven in a whirlwind. And he carries his believing people into heaven through the grave and into eternal life. But we haven't finished the chapter yet, have we? In the final part of today's chapter, Elisha replaced, retraced Elijah's steps, traveling from the Jordan to Jericho and then to Bethel. We're told in verse 18 that Elisha was staying in Jericho. And in verse 19, the people of the city said to him that the town is well situated. But then there's this problem. The water is bad. The NIV translates their next word as the land is unproductive. Uh, but the Hebrew word translated unproductive can also mean barren or even bereaved. And some of the commentators think that it wasn't so much that the land was barren, but the women living on the land were barren. Something about the bad water was causing them to suffer miscarriages. In any case, Elisha put salt into a new bowl. Then he threw the salt into this water spring and he announced that the Lord had healed the water so that we never again cause death or barrenness. And our narrator confirms for us that the water remained wholesome right up to the time of writing. It wasn't the salt which cured the water, but it was the Lord who cured the water. The salt was only a sign to signify what he was doing. Elisha moved on from there to Bethel. Uh, Bethel featured in 1 Kings 13 as the place where the wicked king Jeroboam had set up his man-made religion. 
And as, as Elisha was walking along the road, some youths came out of the town and they jeered at him. Uh, some translations say they were boys, but they were older than boys. They were youths. And uh, they jeered at Elisha, calling him bald head. Uh, whereas Elijah was a hairy man. It seems that Elisha was the opposite. But as well as insulting his appearance, they said to him, go on up. In other words, clear off. Keep going. We don't want you here. Instead of welcoming the Lord's prophet, they told him to leave. And he responded by calling down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And the Lord caused two bears to come out of the woods. And the bears mauled 42 of the ewes. Now that might seem a bit random. Uh, but it's not because in Leviticus 26, God warned his people that he would send curses on them if they disobeyed him in the promised land. If they obeyed, he would uh, bless them with good things. But if they disobeyed, uh, watch out. And in verse 22 of Leviticus 26, God said that if the people remained hostile to him and refused to listen to him, then he would send wild animals against the, his people and they will rob them of their children. So that's what we read in Leviticus. And by telling Elisha to leave, these youths made clear that they were hostile to the Lord and unwilling to listen to him. And so God said, did what he said he would do, and he sent wild animals against them. And what's the point of these two stories? Well, they confirm that Elisha was indeed Elijah's successor. God worked powerfully through Elijah, and now he will work powerfully through Elisha. But more importantly, as the Lord's servant, Elijah brought blessings and curses. To those who received him and believed God's word, as the people in Jericho did, he brought blessings, good things. But to those who rejected him and who would not listen, as the people in Bethel did, he brought curses. And he therefore foreshadows the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great prophet who came into the world to declare the word of God. And he still proclaims the word of God through preachers who are sent out into all the world in his name. And how we respond to Christ and his message will determine whether we experience God's curse or God's blessing. Those who don't listen to Christ and to his message of salvation and eternal life will suffer the wrath and curse of God in this life and the next as he lets them fall deeper and deeper into sin and into all the misery which sin brings. But those who listen to Christ and to his message of salvation and eternal life will receive the blessing of God in this life and the next, including the forgiveness of their sins and peace with God and his fatherly care, the presence of the Spirit to help them, the fellowship of God's people to encourage, and the hope of the resurrection, eternal life in his presence. Christ has paid for our sins with his life. He was raised from the dead on the third day. He ascended to heaven. And as our great prophet, he proclaims peace and eternal life to all who believe in his name. And to all who believe in his name, he gives peace and eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, giving us the Lord Jesus Christ to be our great prophet and that he proclaims uh, your word. Uh, he proclaimed it when he was on the earth. He proclaims it now through preachers who preach in his name. Lord God, will you help us to believe in Christ and in the message of salvation and eternal life that we might receive not curses, but blessings in this life and in the next. Help us, Lord God, to uh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that all who trust in the late Lord Jesus Christ have the hope of uh, everlasting life in your presence. Uh, that death is not now the penalty for our sins, but that's the doorway into your presence, which is better by far than anything else. So, Lord God, we thank you for the great hope we have of eternal life because of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to sing our closing hymn, which is um, Come, let us join our cheerful songs.
forth in the name of the Lord. This is God's charge. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.